Okay, hi there. This week I got this huge box, and this box came from Egypt. Um, yes, all the way from Egypt, UPS to my doorstep. So let's open this up and see what's inside of it. Okay, if you are a vintage computer enthusiast, then this thing may even be familiar to you if you watch eBay. This appeared on eBay a couple of years ago, and this is the $25,000 Convergent Mini Frame from Egypt with the broken propeller. Here's the original listing from way back when and when it first debuted. Okay, this thing's had a rough ride over the last few years. It started out at $25,000 but didn't sell. And it just kind of bounced around, got bumped down and down and down. Um, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's a nice collectible, but it's in Egypt. And most of the people who want to collect it are probably in the States or in Europe or something. So there's a shipping cost that is a little bit of, um, of an impediment. Plus, you know, the seller actually wanted some decent money for it. And there's just not that many of us interested in old convergent computers. So... The group is growing. Uh, me and a few friends um, are working on restoring these. Um, I can give you some pointers later in the video. Um, but anyway, it went down and down and down. Eventually, it got all the way down to a $1 no reserve auction. And I was all set to bid on that. And the night before it was to go up on auction, uh, the seller pulled it. And the reason he probably pulled it was uh, because he was afraid that you know it was only going to sell for a buck and he wanted more than a buck. So he canceled that auction, he relisted it for $144, and I bought this thing for $144. Okay, let's go ahead and open this up. So it actually, it snaps apart at the top. And I've already taken a screwdriver in and kind of wedged it so it's kind of loose. Uh, but I think it's ready to come open. And there we go. Very dusty and dirty. And smells a little bit off, but uh, maybe I can clean some of that dirt out. We'll be fine. Um, up here we have the floppy drive. We have a, some kind of a ginormous power supply. That thing is huge. There's this whole thing down here, and then there's more to it down here. Power supply comes out, hooks up to the main board. I'll give you a better shot of the main board in a moment. And then here we have a 10 megabyte hard drive. Now I can see from the seller's picture. And here it is, there's a loose, and what looks like an MFM uh, cable. It's weird because uh, the other MFM cable should be more pins to it. You know, I can feel it's plugged down there. Um, so I don't know, I don't know what this extra MFM cable, the small cable is doing there. It should have a, a small cable and a big cable. Um, the small cable's hooked up, the big cable's missing. Uh, one of our first tasks is going to be to pull this hard drive out and see if this hard drive can be imaged. See if it's any good. I have my doubts, but we'll find out. Uh, the other thing we're going to have to do is get into the power supply and figure out um, what's up with the power supply. Why is the fan not spinning? Is the power supply putting out the right voltage? Is the power supply broken? Does it need recapping? What's going to go on there? So, Okay, and then here is another uh, top-down view trying to get kind of a different angle on it. I, I really need to get my normal camera mount mounted back up here so I can get you a, a proper top down but uh, until then here's another view kind of from the other angle you see the main board down at the bottom connectors here for the drives ports out the back and the piggyback board that I'm assuming is RAM um, sitting there okay let's do a quick tour of the main board so I have pulled the memory expansion off so we can see what's under there over here we have a 68010 CPU as well as a couple BIOS chips for it. I believe this here is a 8253 counter timer. It's another 8253 over here. There's an 8259 right there. Uh, we've got a metal bracket that's kind of annoyingly uh, obscures things. It's um, actually screwed in from the bottom, so you have to pull the main board off and then undo these screws and you can get this thing apart. Um, over here, I believe this is one of the serial port chips. And this is another serial port chip, so it's got um, a couple of serial ports, maybe something like a printer port and then a cluster communications port. You've got the Western Digital hard drive controller, WD-1010. You've got the floppy controller here. Uh, back here you have several jacks. We've got the hard drive 
um, control jack there, the data jack for the uh, first hard drive, the data jack for the second one, and a floppy jack. Of course here you've got power coming in, lots of programmable array logic so you can see several of them with little white labels on but I think a lot of these other ones like maybe here 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 even without labels are programmable array logic the service manual for this actually has um, listings of the logic for the programmable array logic so if we had a bad pal we could maybe even reprogram one but you know it's really not that complicated of a board uh, you know there's a lot of glue in here but not a lot of peripherals you basically got your counter timers your interrupt your serial ports and your device controllers over here we have our reset button diagnostic lights Okay, let's start by removing this hard drive. Okay, 10 megabyte um, hard drive. On the back, oops, something just fell out of there. I'm going to want to find that. But MCC1 CTIX 3.0 Master. Okay, next, let's talk about imaging the hard drive. So it's actually imaging right now. I'll go back, I'll show you the software in a moment, but I wanted to first overview the hardware. So we've got the hard drive that came out of the convergent computer. It's wired up to my 5 volt power supply as well as 12 volt power supply. And then here we have the MFM emulator. So you buy these online. Uh, you can buy the bearer uh, circuit board, which is what I did, and then you can build it yourself. There's actually a beagle bone green underneath here, Be little beagle bone computer board, kind of like a Raspberry Pi, but not really. Um, and then it hooks up and it emulates an MFM adapter and from the software you can image a hard drive which is what's happening it can also emulate an MFM drive itself so once we have imaged the hard drive we can take this adapter we can put it in the conversion computer and this will be its new hard drive so rather than the somewhat temperamental um, hard drive here the mechanical one which you know prone to failure after like 50 years and we'll have this nice uh, semiconductor one and you can go in here and you can actually replace images, edit images, have multiple images, you know, all the bells and whistles. Okay, I'm about to start the MFM reader. I've already done an analysis pass, which spit out most of this stuff here, at least all of this stuff here. So it already analyzed it. It figured out the sector count, the number of heads. Uh, now, the number of cylinders was actually 256, though I know from previous experimentation that tracks um, 214 and above are not formatted, so it's just a waste of time to try to read them. So I've already done one read of this, uh, and I'm just gonna come back and I'm gonna try it one more time with a higher retry count. This is the retry count here, and we'll see if we can get most, if not all, of the, uh, the disk image off of this convergent mini frame. There we go, so it's seeking all the way back to track zero and it's reading its cylinders. Okay, so there we had a bad sector this time. Okay, here's where it is after it's been running a little bit longer. So you can see it has recovered multiple errors that it ran into. It hasn't recovered all errors. For example, here on uh, cylinder 15 head zero, um, sector 16, there was an unrecoverable sector. We've lost that one. We can come back, we can try it again later. But uh, we're just slowly grinding through the sectors. Uh, retrying and recovering as we go. Okay, let's take a look around the operating system. So I have to give some thanks out to some other people in the community. So a particular user, Agent B, over at the uh, Forgotten Machines community, um, he managed to hand me a patch tool that will allow me to mount that file system on my Linux PC. So the operating system that the Miniframe ran was CTIX. This is a variant of Unix System 5 modified by Convergent Technologies to run on their mini frame. And uh, we're able to mount that here, so let's go in and take a look at it. Now, I have previously done videos on CTOS, CTOS being a very different operating system than CTIX. I took the file system image and I mounted it in slash mount on my Ubuntu 18 machine. So we should be able to go in here and just ls. And there we go. So here is the root of the CTIX installation. Um, so looking around, you know, there's some programs here in bin. 
uh, user bin is going to have a bunch more programs. So typical Unix stuff here, you know, tail, STTY, sort, said, uh, the kinds of things you would have under system uh, five. Um, of course, an Etsy directory, Etsy uh, message of the day. Yeah, my bad. Etsy slash MOTD. Um, welcome to Miniframe CTIX, trademarks of convergent technologies. Uh, there's also an Etsy password file, which has some accounts. I'm not going to print it because it actually has the real name of one of the um, users of this computer, and I don't want to share any personally identifiable information. It's really easy to crack passwords from uh, this era. So I did use a tool called John the Ripper, and I've been able to extract the user account passwords for three of the users. It got the first two of them in a in an hour or two, and then the the last one it took um, just about half a week. But even without that, we could we have we own the operating system image here, so we could simply change uh, the password hashes in Etsy password. Is this uh, in install directory and let's see, let's install? Um, I'm not that familiar with uh, System Five to know how all of these work. Obviously, these are not. Um, archives or anything they're too small for that but maybe these are descriptions of the software that was installed on this machine so it's some kind of accounting thing basic compiler COBOL uh, Fortran um, Pascal uh, looks like some interesting stuff um, d0 dot desk what is that that's something about the hard drive um, this is this is not exactly accurate because this does not match the hard drive that we have uh, the hard drive that we have only has 214 cylinders and only six heads so i don't know exactly what that is is that a different hard drive that was used somewhere in this machine's history i'm not sure um let's see what else is in here let's um, ls etsy log uh more etsy log con file um yeah so here's some stuff in the history of the machine 1985 uh well lots of scrolling through stuff here um one of the things we did notice that was interesting is the amount of memory on this machine has changed a few times so here it's listing 512k and now we know it has a megabyte installed in it by looking at the hardware but here it listed 1.5 megabytes scrolling back up there's one megabyte interesting that it's it seems to have had some history at least with this image maybe this image has been moved between multiple machines okay so i think the next task is to get into this power supply and have a look there's two things to look at one is going to be the broken propeller that is the fan and the other one is going to be the voltage selection now this thing i think is marked on the back of it that it's 220 volt but I've been told that there is a selector someplace in this power supply that will let us switch between 220 and 110. Look around in here, certainly not your average power supply. If we look real close in here, there is this jumper. I pulled it loose. And there are actually two spots where it can be plugged in. Up here is marked 230. Down there marked 115. Okay, so it's about time for the moment of truth. Um, I pulled off the other half of the case. I just unscrewed it from the uh, hinges uh, just because it's really hard to get in there and work on it um, while that big chunk of case is sticking out. And I did move the jumper from the 230 side down here to the 115 side. Um, I can see that the fan is a 115 volt fan. I have, of course, unhooked all the electronics. Let me, um, well, we're going to hope the power supply is all right and doesn't damage the floppy because I don't have a real great way to unplug that one. And I did kind of want to check the power here uh, from that cable. So um, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to turn it on. Let's find the power cord. And we'll see what kind of uh, voltages come out down there. There we go, 12.59 volts on the yellow wire. Oh look, the, the propeller is spinning. The propeller is spinning. You gotta see this. 
Look at that. I mean, it said right in the listing, propeller does not spin, and there it is. Going round and round. It's not going very fast, uh, but it's going. Um, and then here you can see the 12.5 uh, volts coming out of that one. Go down here, we'll check the other one. 5.618 volts. It's, it's, it's a little bit much. I wonder if we should adjust that down. There are some adjustment pots. Here's a close-up on the power supply. It does have a convergent part number down here. But it's also, uh, the original manufacturer would be Power Systems Incorporated. And it is a PS1554C. Um, there are some capacitors I could replace on this. So I've looked at it. These are 470 microfarad 200 volt. And over here we have 470 microfarad 50 volt. Um, these are Nichicons, which is nice. Uh, so Nichicons, even 50 years old, may well still be good. It's a very nice, clean power supply. Um, back of it looks nice and clean. There's no evidence that it's ever been recapped or anything like that. And then here is the fan that came out of it. There's a 115 volt fan. It's an Alpha 5 by Torin. Now this thing is very heavy. The, the case on this thing is actually cast iron, I think. Because there was a ground wire that just screwed right there into the fan case. So like I say, this thing is quite heavy. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to replace it with a 120 millimeter Noctua fan and just run it off of 12 volt. There's, I don't, I don't think there's any reason to um, replace it with another big, huge, heavy 115 volt fan. Okay, so I wanted to test out the power supply, so I've, I've pulled the power supply. It's sitting here. I have my multimeter hooked up to the 5 volt. I have this Kunkin DC load hooked up to the 5 volt set to 12 amps because that's what Convergent specifies as the minimum 5 volt load on this power supply and I have another um, power resistor sitting over here on the 12 volt because yes even the 12 volt has um, a minimum load 100 milliamps on that so let's turn the power supply on so there we are um, 12 amps now you can ignore the voltage reading on this, it's reading 3.9, but there's some voltage drop in these cables that's supplying it. What's important is the fluke over here, which is 5.031, which is good. And then over here we can see there's really not any ripple, uh, any significant ripple going on. You know, if the, if the capacitors, the filtering capacitors were bad, then you would see those capacitors break down. Um, so 12 volts, that was sort of the minimum. If we go up to... Probably 15 is pretty good for how loaded we'll have this system. So we're at 4.926 volts. I think the spec said 5 volts plus or minus um, 2%, so that's still within spec. If we go all the way up to 18 amps, that's what it actually says is maximum. We're now out of spec by about um, 0.07 volts. Okay, in preparation for the knock to a fan I'm going to put in, I soldered a couple wires to the board, this black one and this yellow one, a couple unused pads over here where I was able to grab the 12 volt and the ground, and that will run our fan. Now I know I'm being just a little bit neurotic over this power supply and its minimum uh, amperage, and I know Convergent engineered the thing that is supposed to have a 12 amp minimum load, but I really just don't like that um, when there's no load on it at all, the thing just goes wild, it goes up to 6 volts or more, it kind of oscillates, it does all kinds of bad stuff. It's understandable, it's below the minimum load, but even just putting one amp load on it will prevent uh, the thing from freaking out like that. So I went a little bit overboard and I added a little uh, resistor here. There's a 4.7 ohm 50 watt power resistor. Um, this will dissipate just about an amp. Um, and you know, about I think somewhere between 5 and 10 watts. So you know, that will kind of make up for. Uh, the lacking the hard drive. The hard drive I think was pulling about an amp, amp and a half, so this will offset this. And since I'm putting it in the power supply, it will never be the case where I can operate this power supply with less than one amp. It'll still output a little bit too much voltage because we're below the minimum load, but it won't you know, just start going nuts and going up to dangerous voltage levels. So right now we're ready to power this on. Uh, let's turn it on. 
I have my uh, fan. I didn't have my Noctua. My Noctua is not due until tomorrow. So I use a spare fan out of my uh, Synology NAS. Um, hooked up to the 12 volt. Let's power it on. And there we go. The propeller is spinning. It's putting out a good amount of air. So we have fixed the one thing we knew was wrong with it. Right now we have 5.3 volts on the 5 volt. Okay, let's go ahead and observe a boot sequence. So right now it's off. I'm going to turn it on. And what we can see, we saw all five lights uh, turn on, and then we saw the red and the green are on. The green is always on when it has power, and the manual has the various codes in, but if you've got the single red, this means that it is trying to recalibrate its drives. So right now the floppy drive is not plugged in, and the MFM emulator is not turned on. Uh, so it cannot, it has no drives actually hooked up to it, so it's just sitting there waiting in a recalibrate loop. So next I'm going to go turn on the MFM emulator, and then you will see these lights do something more as it uh, recalibrates the MFM drive and tries to load the boot image. Okay, so now we've got a new sequence of lights because it was able to calibrate the drive and it tried to load the boot image and it failed to load the boot image. That's what the yellow here and the red down there means. Uh, so unfortunately this is as far as I have been able to get. I am pretty much convinced with my MFM emulator that I have a viable boot image. I've also tried booting off the original hard drive. I've tried booting another image that a friend uh, gave me that I, I know works and I cannot get anything to happen there. Um, so unfortunately I don't have any floppy media so I'm not able to try a floppy boot. Unfortunately I don't have any floppy media so I'm not able to try a floppy boot. I'm kind of stuck at this point pending trying to mess with some stuff on the board. Uh, so I have already gone through this and I reseated every IC in its socket just to see if there was an IC that was not plugged in good. Okay, so unfortunately that's about as far as I'm going to get until some more parts show up in the mail. Then we'll try the next step. So this is part one of the video. Hopefully in part two we will get the thing resolved, repaired, and bootable. I would like to thank AJ, Agent B, and all the other guys over at the uh, Forgotten Machines uh, group. Um, we have a group of enthusiasts who are interested in convergent computers. We're in touch with some former convergent employees. We're trying to build a community to restore some of these machines and get them working. So this is the part of the video where I usually ask people if you have any Convergent Technologies materials, if you have boot images, uh, floppies, hard drives, documentation, disks, you know, anything, tapes, whatever you might have, um, if you have anything like that, please do shoot us a line. There are lots of people who would be very interested in this, even if you just have experiences with these computers, a history, if you worked on them, um, that's all very useful. If you are a former Convergent Technologies employee who might have worked on these things back in the you know, 80s or 90s or whenever they were uh, relevant, we'd like to know. People do actually contact us from time to time and we have managed to get in touch with some software developers. We've got some very useful resources. But there is just a ton of information that has been lost about these computers and it's just not available. So here's where we would really like the community if you have anything that might be useful, please send it our way and we will get it out there and we will make these uh, things relevant again. Thank you for watching my video. Please visit my website at www.smbaker.com for more electronics projects and sandrail stuff. Bye.